Hey there everybody, Mr. Mark with you, and today we're reviewing momentum, including conservation momentum and the impulse momentum theorem. So the way that I'm going to kind of organize this is by comparing what we do with objects with what we do with systems. So to find the momentum of an object, we simply multiply the mass of the object by its velocity. Keeping in mind that things that are moving in different directions need to have different signs for their velocity. To find the momentum of a system, we simply do that for all the different parts of the system and then add the parts up. So momentum of thing one plus thing two plus thing three, et cetera, et cetera. And so kind of going back and reviewing what we know about physics so far, we first define Newton's first law. Um, and we said that when there are no forces acting on an object or when the forces are balanced, in other words, when the net force is zero, the velocity of that object is constant. And so in a system of objects, if the net external force is zero, then the velocity of the center of mass is constant and the momentum of the system is conserved. And so that's kind of a way of expressing Newton's first law for a system of objects. Newton's second law, we took um, acceleration equals net force over mass and we kind of did a little bit of algebra to it to get the momentum impulse theorem, which is that impulse or F delta T is equal to the change in momentum. And of course, we can also find the um, impulse by finding the area under a force versus time graph. So the same thing would be true for a system of objects, only the net external force would be the external force on the entire system. And so we can't figure out the force on a single object within a system if we only know information about the system as a whole. We're going to look at an example of that a little bit later. And then Newton's third law, the force exerted on A by B is equal to the opposite of the force on B exerted by A. Um, we found that the impulse exerted on A would also have to be equal and opposite to the impulse exerted on B. And that led us to our expression of the law of conservation of momentum. Because if one, one thing loses has to equal what another thing gains, the total has to remain constant. So let's do one example together real quick in which we can kind of illustrate a couple of these different things um, and tie the object and system view together a little bit. And so here's our situation. We've got a two kilogram blue cart that's moving at 10 meters per second towards a stationary three kilogram red cart. And then they collide and smack into each other. And afterwards, the eight kilogram cart's moving to the right at eight meters per second. And we wanna first figure out what happened to the red cart, what impulse was exerted on it, and then also what's the blue cart doing after the collision, like how fast is it going. And so to find the impulse on the red cart, remember that impulse is equal to change in momentum. And so the like F delta T expression is not going to be really helpful here because I don't know how much force was exerted during this collision, but I do know the change in momentum of the red cart. So when we find impulse, like when a question asks you just, hey, find the impulse, we have to remember that there's a few different ways to do that. And we have to be smart enough to figure out which way would be appropriate for that situation. So here, since I know what the red card is doing in terms of its velocity, I could find its change in momentum. That would be the impulse. And so change is just final value minus initial value. So the final momentum of the red cart would be like 24 kilogram meter per second, or 24 mariks. The initial was zero since it was at rest. And so just 24 mariks minus zero would be 24 mariks. When we write our answers down, we need to include the direction. And so let's, let's be specific that that's 24 mariks to the right. You can also think about that as being a gain of 24 mariks. So when we find the velocity of the blue cart, there's a couple different ways we could do that as well. First, we could just use the fact that the momentum change of the blue cart has to be the opposite of the momentum change of the red cart. And so we could just say that the delta P for blue has to be negative delta P of the red. And so since the red cart gained 24 mariks, the blue cart must have lost. 24 marks. That's got to be true in order for Newton's third law to be true. And so the original momentum of the blue cart was like 20 marks. If I then add negative 24 marks to that, that leaves me with a final momentum of negative 4 
bar x. And then dividing that momentum by a mass would give me the velocity. So negative two meters per second. And then realize we need to clearly indicate that that's two meters per second to the left. The second method to do this is to use conservation momentum. Since there's no indication of an external force here, I can claim that momentum is conserved. So the momentum of this system would simply be the 20 kilogram times meter per second that the blue car originally started with. There's nothing else in the system moving before the collision. And so write a conservation momentum equation for after the collision, um, like the momentum of the red cart plus the momentum of the blue cart has to equal 20 marks. And then just algebraically solve for your missing blue velocity. And so we find the momentum of the red cart to be 24. The system has to add up to 20. And so the momentum of the blue cart must be negative 4 in order for that to be true. And then dividing both sides by the mass would give you the same negative 2 meters per second which we should clearly indicate is two meters per second to the left. And so either of those ways would work if we're, all we cared about was how fast it's going, but that's an illustrative um, example of how the law of conservation momentum comes from the impulse momentum expression of Newton's third law, because what's gained by one thing has to equal what's lost by the other. If I was interested in how much force was exerted on these carts, I would have to know how long they were in contact with each other. And so this doesn't give me information about the internal force, but in a situation like this, the internal force may not necessarily be something we really care about. We really just kind of want to know what the things do after they collide with each other. And so if I knew how long they were in contact, then I could divide the momentum change by that time to get the force, if I was interested in that. So the next thing we might be interested in is, is the collision elastic or inelastic? And elastic means that the kinetic energy of the system stays constant in addition to the momentum. We're gonna get into energy a little bit more in detail later on. And so if I find the energy of the system before the collision, just do 1 half mv squared for both things, I would get 100 joules. And if I did the same thing for after the collision, keeping in mind that when you square a negative number, you always get a positive number, I would get 100 joules as well. So since the energy after is equal to the energy before, then that means the collision is elastic. Elastic doesn't have anything to do with how much bounciness they are. That's often an indication that a collision is elastic when they bounce apart, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it is an elastic collision. Elastic means that the energy has to stay constant. A quick, de quick couple of details. Um, when you have to find the impulse from a graph of force versus time, you find the area under the graph. And it's important to remember that that is the area between the line that is graphed and the x-axis. And if it's above the x-axis, it's a positive area. If it's below, it's negative. Second little detail, remember that the velocity of the center of mass of a system is constant when momentum is conserved, when there are no external forces. And so we, we see a lot of these kind of questions in AP1. Here's a rocket, it's cruising to the right at 100 meters per second, and then it explodes and the back part does that, and the front part does this, what is the velocity of the center of mass? Well, the center of mass velocity was 100 meters per second before the explosion, because everything was going to the right at 100 meters per second. That means it's gotta be 100 meters per second after the collision. And so the center of mass velocity being constant is kind of a little detail right now for you guys, but later on, that is gonna be much, much, much more meaningful. Kind of setting you up for like, future physics here. And so keep that in mind, you won't be asked to find the velocity of the center of mass in AP1 unless at some point you have one object. Either they um, two things collide and stick together or one thing separates into two or more pieces. So look at the picture that you have one object and that will tell you the velocity of the center of mass. So let's look at one last example real quick. And I'm just gonna take my previous example and I'm just going to change the numbers at the end. And so the red cart still has an initial velocity of 10 meters per second, but in this new situation, it bounces back at three meters per second. And the red cart then cruises forward at 12 meters per second. And so if I change those numbers, 
the only way that I'm going to do that is by exerting a force at some point between the first picture and the second picture. Um, that force could be something like gravity. Uh, maybe the track isn't level. That's a possibility. Um, it could be something like um, a magnet nearby pulling or pushing on my carts. It could just be kicking, be kicking them. You know, we don't know, but we know that there's an external force because the momentum changed. And so the original momentum is still 20 marks. But if I calculate the final momentum using those new velocities, remember that the three needs to be negative since it's going to the left, then I would get 30 marks. And so since the momentum of the system changed, there must have been a external force acting on the system. Otherwise, the momentum would not have changed. And if I knew how long that force was acting, I could figure out how big that force was, um, simply by taking our impulse momentum theorem and solving for the external force. And so I don't know how long they were interacting with each other, but I do know that the bigger that time gets, then the smaller that force would have to be. And those were kind of the games we were playing when we were studying things like seat belts and crumple zones. Increasing the time of a collision would decrease the force because you have the same impulse. And so if we knew the time of collision or how long that force was acting, we could figure out how large that external force is. So I hope this review has been helpful for you. Um, feel free to reach out to me if you need uh, some clarification on anything. Otherwise, good luck in your studies, and I'll see y'all later. Ta-ta.